and among those who lay in wait from 8.15 in the morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon were Jim Spud Murphy, Jim Crowley, Jack Hennessy, who was wounded in the engagement, Ned Young, Pat Donovan, Tim O'Connell. Joining these legendary boys of Kilmichael in the seven-day studio tonight are other survivors of that West Cork Brigade, Michael Crowley, Christy O'Connell, Dr. Eugene Nudge Callanan, and the man who commanded them then and commands our attention now, General Tom Barry. General, you are among the happy survivors, and who in this studio tonight do you miss most? Well, before I answer that question, I would like to say, Brian, that um, we're only a sample here of the fighting men of West Cork. And Kilmichael was only one of many, many engagements. Now, you were good enough to bring us together tonight and to allow us to meet again. But uh, I would like to say that uh, we are only a representative of a far, far bigger body. Now, I suppose two-thirds of the fighting men of West Cork are dead and gone, but still a third of them are there. And these men are not forgotten tonight by us, their comrades who are here. We are, uh, we are in the happy position of being survivors and nobody can tell why any one of us survives. But I want to say just one word, I know our time is limited, that without the men in the battalions and the companies, and without the other fighting men who are not here, and without the help of the common man and uh, above all the people, the poor people of West Cork, who stood behind us through thick and thin. There'd be no survivors here. And uh, this battle and this fight right through uh, during the period from 19, the end of 1919 or beginning 1920 onwards was one in which uh, we lost 64 men killed altogether. And they are in our thoughts tonight. But I want to make it clear, we're only a sample. Now, <coughs> with regard to the fight at Kilmichael, it was probably the bloodiest fight in Ireland. Because the West Cork Brigade column, from the time it was organized, it never, never mounted an attack on the British military, police, tans, or spies, or informers, or anybody else. That it didn't mount the attack from five to seven yards range. And I think that was one of the main reasons of our success. And another reason, of course, was that the type of men that did form the West Cork Brigade, that they were men who were dedicated men, and men who had proved in their lifetime, and many of them by their debts, that they were men who were not going to remain members of the subject race. Now, we've, we'll have to go on to the Augsies. <laughs> These are all just commissioned... Just second, General, if I may interrupt, let's ask Pat Donovan, what was it like? Do you remember waiting that Sunday? Yeah, it was a long time waiting because I had to wait so long, I read. Do you remember what you thought about? Had you shot at a man before? What? What were you thinking about as you waited there? Oh, we were waiting for the lorries to come on. That's what we were thinking about all day. We were waiting all day. And that's what we were thinking about the whole time. No for now when they come on. Spud Murphy, were you nervous that day? Oh. <laughs> I was never nervous in my life. <laughs> were you less nervous after the event than before? Put it that way. I was nervous before or after it. <coughs> Nudge Callan, and you weren't there, but what? Why do you think the Ogses had to be knocked? Well, because they were they were terrorising the countryside, and if they weren't met at that stage, I don't know what happened to have happened to fight. And yet, for a long time, there wasn't fighting, Jack Hennessy. For a long time, people apparently were prepared to simply sit underneath it. What made people in West Cork different, would you say? Or were they different to people elsewhere in the country? 
I would say that at that time, uh, towards the end of 1920, the pressure was mounting, and that these people, these Oxies, had gone right through Ireland, burning and shooting and pillaging. And they had to be stopped. And the position that was selected to stop them was either they would come out of it or the IRA would come out of it. None of the two lots would come out of it because these would have, these would have taken no prisoners to McCroom and they had to be stopped. And I, for one, anyway, would have been satisfied to lose 10 men to wipe out the 16 or 17 of them. And uh, of that, we were proud that we were able to do it, even though we were men without experience in the main. We were men that had never met these fellows before, and we were men that were suffering from a fear of these chaps that that they, they had gone through Ireland terrorizing and shooting and killing, and we were wondering, if we didn't stop them, could the country take them? There were 1,500 of them there, <laughs> backed up by some 30 or 40,000 troops and by I don't know how many thousand black and tans. But these fellows were the ace terrorists. Uh, the morning of it, it uh, there was undoubtedly a tough baptism of fire because outside one or two of the men who were at Kilmichael, they had never been in action before. And they got a tough time because they started marching and marching through rain and from the rain, it froze as soon as they got to Kilmichael. And they knew and they were told that Kilmichael, that either they or the other fellows would come out of it. As it happened, these fellows didn't relish close quarter fighting. <laughs> and most of the fighting finished up on the road. <clears throat> now, there was one problem, and the problem was how to slow them down. And we had luck. The ball hopped our way. And we had the luck of deciding that an officer would stand on the ditch facing them as they came along in full equipment and that, with map case and bomb and, and the rest of the thing, uniform. Volunteer uniform, of course, not British uniform, as the British tried to say. And that they'd be bound to... to um, slow down. To, to, to slow down. We didn't want to stop them altogether, but to slow down so that they'd investigate. And they did slow down. And they came, and a, the bomb was thrown, and a gun opened on them. And with a lot of luck again, the bomb landed at 25 yards or 30 away. Mm -hmm while they were coming on down to it. It landed in the front seat. That gave the, that gave us the advantage of surprise. In guerrilla warfare, surprise and mobility are, uh, and toughness of men. Now these men, the test not alone was of the courage of these men who fought there, but there was a test of an endurance and toughness because they marched on night through rain. They had nothing to eat all day except one loaf, one, one, one bastard of cake was sent down and a uh, rocket of tea from poor people mm -hmm. who uh, probably gave us what they had themselves. And they had to stick out. It started to freeze and some of their clothes got stiff. But they stuck that out. And they fought the battle and it was a vicious battle and a bloody battle. And it was hardly a fair battle to put men who weren't experienced in warfare in against these bunch of terrorists, toughs, who ranked and whose, whose ranks were given, they were wearing medal ribbons, DSOs and MCs, whose ranks were given in their death roll when they announced the 17 dead as captains up to colonel. They were commanded by a colonel. Well, I'm not going to go into details because we haven't much time, but they got a test again then. They had to march back and they had to sleep in their clothes that <coughs> night inside in a cottage, lying on straw, uh, some Twelve miles the way we went back across Man's Bridge and into an empty laborer's cottages, cottage. Well, uh, these men uh, actually, after what happened, um, the British left them there for a good many hours, and they didn't. They knew they were ambushed, but they didn't come out because they thought we had a large force. Now we had all the rifles in the brigade, which is about 36 at the time. There, we captured. 17 rifles there and 34 revolvers and a few bombs off them. And we got a most important thing, their notebooks. 
And they might say now, for a public record, that uh, every one of them that was searched for, searching for information, they carried a flask full of brandy, which they had looted.